What I have prepared is something that, that Tony Negri and I are working on now, so you get the benefits and maybe detriment to of, of the uh, not completely formulated thoughts. Um, and in fact, I, I wanted to start or frame it with an anecdote. What I want to talk about is about property law and the common. That's, that's, and, and the common is what um, the seminar is about. So the students here have already heard a certain amount about it. I, I'll repeat a little bit from the morning. I hope not too much. Um, and so the incident that the anecdote, yeah, that, that, that led me down this line, line of thinking um, about property law was an invitation to Harvard Law School uh, this last year by the, grad, by the students, the law students at, at the law school for uh, what they told me would be a symposium on the common. And I was intrigued uh, and curious by it. And so what I thought I should start out with is um, to give you an idea of what Tony and I mean, mean by the common and also an idea of what I, uh, the kind of thing I presented to them. And then I could continue with the anecdote with the part that's, that's maybe more interesting. So let me start with this notion of the common and, and its relationship uh, to property. So both public property and private property. And I guess even almost as a preview, I'm thinking about, and I'll come back to this later, I'm thinking that this is a three-part relationship uh, between private property, public property, by which I mean primarily property regulated and controlled by the state, and the common. The common as being neither private nor public. And the common, which, which well, whereas the first two, public property and private property figure within uh, the realm of the legal tradition, the common primarily doesn't. Okay, so let me start with the, then this sort of introduction about, pri uh, about property and the common. For centuries, the ruling powers have told us that private property is sacred and it is a sacred and inalienable right and the bulwark that defends society against chaos. Without private property, there is no freedom, no justice, no economic development, no social life as we know it. Today, however, it's increasingly clear that private property is just the opposite. It's an obstacle to economic development, the keystone of structures of unjust social control, and the prime factor that creates and maintains social inequalities. The problem with property is not just that some have it and some don't. The nature of private property itself is a scandal. The definitions of private property, let me just give you an idea where I'm starting with on this. Uh, I, I read, and this is part of what comes into question later, I think of uh, private property defined by the early modern European tradition. And in some ways, these notions of property were written into constitutions throughout the world from the 18th to the 20th centuries, and in some ways uh, characterize our legal common sense. Um, here, for instance, is Hugo Grotius, you know, so now, now I'm, I'm, I'm going back to early modern thought. Grotius writes that ownership, dominium, connotes possession of something particularly one's own to the exclusion of other parties. In fact, this notion of exclusion is characteristic of early notions of private property. Uh, Blackstone, Blackstone's definition in some ways uh, echoes Grotius, but adds more uh, poetic uh, flair. Here's what Blackstone writes, he says, there's nothing which so, which so generally strikes the imagination and engages the affect, affections of mankind as the right of property, or that soul and despotic dominion which one man claims and exercises over the external things of the world in total exclusion of the right of any other individual in the universe. That sounds even better. Uh, so the essential characteristic of these definitions of property is a monopoly over use and decision making to the exclusion of all others. Like that's the way I'm understanding, at least initially, private property and also in some ways public property. Public property too, I think, is defined by a monopoly of use and decision making, in this sense controlled by the state. The logic of private property resonates throughout not only the dominant lines of modern legal and political thought, but also the alternatives. 
even the radical denunciation that property is theft is merely the flip side of property claims and paradoxically based on an ideology of property itself. How can you claim something stolen without first assuming its rightful owner? Uh, here I'm thinking this is Marx's critique of Proudhon, Proudhon's notion that property equals theft. Marx criticized them, saying, look, you can't call property theft unless you're already within a property ideology. Private property became, for the modern era, ineluctable, determining both the foundations and the ultimate horizon of political passions, a social good on par with life and liberty. Without property, it was impossible to think ourselves and our world. Today, however, cracks are appearing in the ideology of private property and possession, as property is unable to support either our economic needs or our political passions. Increasingly are emerging social and political projects that defy the rule of property, uh, and in some ways that correspond to Marx and Engels' mandate in the Communist Manifesto when they say in the second part of the manifesto, Marx and Engels write that the essence of uh, what the communists say, I suppose something like this, can be summarized in a single phrase, the abolition of private property. So I guess I have two questions though reading that phrase. One is, what does it mean to abolish property? And the second, maybe more important one is, what is property in the first place? That's what I'm, that's what I'm hoping to get to a bit. But then I, but first I should, should, I should explain, and this is what I was trying to explain to the students at Harvard Law School, is what I or Tony and I understand as the common. Um, and primarily what we understand as the common is that which is not property. Like I said before, neither public property nor private property. Hence, we're thinking of it as the negative in both of those aspects of private property. So instead of a monopoly over use, the common involves equal and open access. And instead of a monopoly over decision making, the common would have to involve democratic decision making. So that's the, way, that's the way we're proposing this notion of the common is, yeah, like I said, uh, equal and open access plus democratic management, democratic management or decision making. Do you think I should take, let me just take one little brief uh, added part to head off any questions that might come from someone who's read Garrett Hardin's essay about the tragedy of the commons or versions of that. What this, this is an argument that, even if you don't know the actual essay, might, might, might have come to you in, in various forms, which says essentially that if, if, if social goods or wealth are not either private property or public property controlled by the state, that it will be ruined. Like the idea is that if you have, I don't know, a field for grazing and everyone has equal access to that, then it's going to be destroyed because everyone's going to bring their animals to graze there and, and it will ruin the grass. Or if you allow everyone to fish uh, in a certain part of the ocean, everyone's going to fish there, it will ruin all the fish and no one will have any more. And what Hardin leaves out, this is what um, Eleanor Ostrom writes, and this is in some ways what I'm trying to repeat with this argument here, is that he assumes a notion of the common that does not involve any management of the resources. And so this is Eleanor Ostrom's response and, and maybe could be included in my definition here, which is that I think it's true that any notion of the common cannot only propose open and equal asset access, but also has to propose some mechanism for managing our common goods, something like that. Which the, the difference here, between property and the common that at least Tony and I are proposing is that rather than a monopoly over decision making, that there would be a democratic mechanism, a democratic collective mechanism for determining use, something like that. Yeah, so to come back to, to Hardin's argument about the tragedy of the commons, the idea there was that the only way that you can manage something effectively is if someone owns it and someone will therefore take responsibility for it. And, and Ostrom's proposition, I guess ours too, is that one can manage common resources, put it that way, in a democratic manner rather than a monopolistic manner. That would be the, at least that's the conceptual definition you have. Um, and so let me just give you a couple examples. I give similar examples to these Harvard Law students of uh, fields 
contemporary fields of the affirmation of the common against property. Like one of them, there are many more, but these seem to be ones that I think you'll easily attach to. One is about the sharing of immaterial forms of wealth, like the sharing of music, of codes, of ideas, of images. Um, these are some things that all of you do already all the time, that you're already breaking property laws, whether you mean to or not. Um, but these are fields of, it seems to me, an affirmation of the common, meaning that we should have uh, open and equal access to these um, social goods. So that's one way of thinking about it, the one way you might approach it. A second way, which in some ways overlaps with that, is about resistance to privatization. Uh, you could think about this in legal terms, in terms, it's often posed in terms of uh, patents and copyrights. Like for instance, when common knowledge is, the classic examples that come up for me often go under the rubric of biopiracy, uh, where uh, especially formulated in terms of indigenous knowledges, say Amazonian indigenous tribes that have knowledges of the certain medicinal properties of a plant, when those knowledges are privatized by, 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 uh, by patents and then sold, marketed by Monsanto, a pharmaceutical company, et cetera, this is another example, and the resistance to that would be another field of struggles that affirm the common today, like resisting privatization, resisting the privatization of common knowledges in this case. And the third, maybe I should take a little bit more for this third one, is um, about considering the city or the metropolis as a common space, uh, and in, in some ways resisting both the treatment of the metropolis as either private property or public property, you know, controlled by the government. It seems to me that the cycle of struggles that stretched at least from 2011 to 2013, the various encampments and occupations, were examples of trying to, in part, they did many other things, but, but trying to transform urban space into common space. I think of the encampments themselves this way. Yeah, let me give you an example that 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 strikes. I mean, Zuccotti Park would be one the the one that strikes me or that that has seemed most uh, useful to me is thinking about the Gezi Park protests in Istanbul, Taksim Square Gezi Park protests. And let me give you the brief version that just just to give a an idea about how this is an attempt to affirm the common to affirm the city as common, yeah, put it that way. So the, the Gezi Park protests um, begin as an as a anti-neoliberalism struggle. The, uh, they begin blocking bulldozers in a project that was private but support, completely supported by the government to transform this park in the center of Istanbul into a shopping mall in the shape of an Ottoman barracks. Like, it's a great project, isn't it? And so it was an anti-neoliberalism struggle, you know, trying to block this uh, construction of a shopping mall. But quickly, as the protests transformed into an encampment, that um, what was created is a open space within the city. Like that, and this is really the magic of, of Zuccotti, of all of these encampments in Puerto del Sol in Madrid, of Zuccotti Park in Oakland, in Cinelandi, in, in Rio de Janeiro in 2013, and in, and in Gezi Park. The magic was that it was a space of open and equal access, that the city became something different. But it wasn't just that anyone could come there, it was also an experiment in um, creating democratic mechanisms of the management of that space. So the, the, the General Assembly, or the forums in Turkey, which are very similar, um, were mechanisms to experiment with, allowing everyone to speak, and creating mechanisms of making collective decisions. I yeah, put it that way. So that these, so for briefly, the, these regions of the city, yeah, so it's not only block blocking the privatization of the city and city space, but temporarily creating um, and transforming the city into something common. 
you know, with those two aspects I was saying before, that both open and equal access and a collective or even better democratic mechanism of self-management, of decision making. Yeah, so the two things I'm, I'm working with here, as you can tell, I'm just repeating them another time, is about use and decision. Like those are the two aspects that I, and, and so um, in some ways, whereas monopoly defines them for forms of property, democratic extension defines them for the common. So that's, that's the difference I'm trying to, I'm trying to point to. Okay, I think you get, you get more or less my idea, right? I mean, the central idea, what, what I mean by the common book. So I explained them to them. And then so, so then it, after, after I spoke, one of the uh, Harvard Law professors whose work I'd read and have great respect for and who's a fantastic guy, uh, Duncan Kennedy is his name, he, he responded to me saying that my notion of the common was both a conceptual error and a political error. Uh, and the first uh, way I guess this is an error is um, that my advocacy of the common is aligned with what he considers a conservative position, and maybe I agree with him, a, a, a substantialist notion of property. Like the, in effect, the substantialist notion of property is the one that I presented earlier in terms uh, of early modern European legal theory. Uh, thinking of property as a thing, the rights of the owner of which can be protected constitutionally. So that's the, the conceptual error. And he says um, that the progressive approach, and it's really a, f a primarily US one, but the progressive approach, he insisted, is to work with property not as a substance, not as a single thing um, that the law or the Constitution can protect, but rather consider property as a bundle of rights. Like this is, I'm going to explain this a little bit later, what, that, what this means by uh, that, that property is a bundle of rights. And so uh, that, that was my conceptual error. I misunderstood what property is, because property is not a thing, he said, and therefore its owner doesn't have the exclusive rights over it. Property is rather a bundle of rights that pertain to many. It's a pluralization of it. Like I said, I'm going to come back to this bundle of rights business. And this, the political error is he thinks that, said that, that progressive legal theory and action must work within the law, within property law, to advance certain rights over others. And, and struggling against property is, um, he thought it was both naive and uh, counterproductive. Yeah, so it, it, in, in effect, what I recognized as the discussion went on is that the students had invited me in order to argue with their own professors, uh, their own legal professors, because they disagreed with them. The students, unfortunately, didn't say a word during the entire day. They just wanted me and their professors to talk. And, um, and these are progressive legal theorists. I, and I don't know if Harvard Law School would strike you this way, maybe it wouldn't, but they're some of the most uh, progressive legal professors in the US that, that teach there, and so it's not as if it was uh, sort of conservative. But what I realized as the discussion went on is that there were two versions of the left that were being enacted in this debate. Um, the students, and this they did to me only during breaks, or told me only during breaks or over dinner, was that they accused their so-called professors, uh, progressive professors, of actually being reactionary because they remained only within the legal system. That was, I think, the, the content of it. And the professors accused the students, and me too, I guess, of not being progressive, of, a, of what, they didn't use this term, but the tradition I'm part of would call this infantile leftism. You know, that, that um, and what they were, one thing they were upset with the students about, I guess there's sort of two sides that go to the same point, which is one is they were fear, they feared that their students would not go on to do the progressive legal work that they were trying to teach them how to do, uh, struggling within the law uh, for the benefit of the poor, for the benefit of the marginalized, et cetera, struggling within the law, and that instead they would do, and this is what often came up, Occupy itself came up because many of the law students, at least the ones that were interested in this discussion, 
had been part of and sympathizers with Occupy. And so that was the, uh, those were sort of the terms of the debate. Two versions of the left, each accusing the other of being reactionary. Um, and that's one thing I want to understand. I guess I'm going to come back to that and ask you about it. I guess one other version of this two, two sides of the left, which I'm sure you've seen in a lot of other instances, which is a pragmatic version of the left versus a theory version of the left. Because the other thing that the law professors were accusing me of is being only dedicated to theory. Like, I'm only leftist in theory. Whereas they were pragmatic and they were doing things. They were helping people, which I'm all for. But anyway, so that you can see the different lines lined up. It's, in some ways, it's one of the debates is about reform versus revolution. And one of them is about theory, not just practice, but pragmatism pragmatic approach. Okay, so that here's the two tasks though for the rest of my time. Um, the first is to understand better what is property. I guess this is one thing I realized. I, I actually love situations like this, even, they, even if they make me feel like shit at the time. I realized I didn't know what legal theorists in the US think property is. Like I was a couple centuries behind in my reading. And so, um, so that's one task, learn what is property at least from the perspective of the U.S. legal literature. And that's, that's the main thing that I sort of wanted to almost report to you, what I found out you know, when I went home and did my research. And then the second, which I'm hoping that you'd have something to say about too, and I'll just come back to really at the end, is this question about what is the left um, and how to understand it in at least in the terms, I mean, what is the left me is too large a question. How to understand it in terms of the kind of debate I found myself in, of, and partly about <coughs> pragmatism versus radicalness, partly is theory versus pragmatic approach. And, and I'm, I'm hoping toward the end I can have a way to negotiate that a little bit better. So, so this, now, now, um, um, now I want to mostly read a few pages of something that Tony and I are working on that, that's really trying to um, report to you what I understand not better now and then what I can make of it of how the US legal tradition, the progressive US legal tradition. Yeah, because uh, what I'm really good on to talk about is this progressive line that stretches throughout the 20th century to the present. There is a conservative line of, le of legal reasoning that remains substantialist in its approach. And so what they mean by substantialist uh, conception of property is thinking of prop property as a thing, you know, substance that way, the owner of which has rights to the exclusion of others. You know, that's a, that, that exclusion, the notion of property is a thing and then it's the rights over it being exclusionary. Okay, so here, here I go with a few pages about this, about this tradition in US legal theory. First year, US students in, uh, first year students in US law schools are commonly taught, at least by progressive law professors, that property is not a thing defined exclusively by an individual's right, but a bundle of rights. This formulation, which originates in the US with the so-called legal realists in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, aims to pluralize and socialize the rights of property. Uh, here's what writes one of the legal realists of the early 20th century, Felix Cohen is his name. He says, private property as we know it is always subject to limitations based on the rights of other individuals in the universe. Now, the classic definitions of private property with their exaggerated individualism, according to the legal realists, are profoundly antisocial. That is, they fail to account for the fact that we live in a society and the actions and property of each has effects on others. The conception of a bundle of rights by de-individualizing and deprivatizing the rights of property offers a basis for legitimate state action, this is their interest there, the, of these legal theorists, to enforce social interests against the sole rights of owners. This conception doesn't negate the rights of individual property owners, but instead embeds those rights in a larger field of often conflicting social rights. The bundle of rights conception is a pragmatic intervention in a constitutional law, especially in the context of the Cold War, and many of these arguments from the early 20th century are, 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 are explicitly 
relating to the challenge of the Soviets and of Marxist ideology. So, so this notion of a bundle of rights accepts fully the sacred affirmation of property declared by the constitutions, but it adds that property rights are never only individual, that private property is never merely private, thus transforming the constitutional assertion from the inside. For its advocates, one advantage of the conception is that it avoids what they consider to be unproductive ideological arguments for and against private property, a familiar Cold War trope, and provides instead the means for legal practitioners to struggle within property, advocating for some rights against others. I'll give an example of this in a minute, what it would mean to advocate for some rights against others among this bundle. That, that, that defines each kind of property. One significant con conceptual correlate to the bundle of rights argument is that it blurs the basic division of legal thought and practice between civil law and public law. And it bridges that, the gap, which stretches back to Roman law between dominium, an individual rights over things, and imperium, the sovereign's rights over society. So property is a sovereign power, they argue, not so much in the sense that it repeats the functions of sovereignty on an individual scale, I have sovereign authority over my things, but more importantly, property has sovereign effects on a social scale. Let me quote to you another of these legal realists. This one's name is Morris Cohen. He's not the same as the previous Cohen, but it doesn't matter. He says, we must not overlook the actual fact that dominium over things is also imperium over our fellow beings. The extent of the power over the life of others, which the legal order confers on those called owners, is not fully appreciated by those who think of law as merely protecting men in their possessions. That's the end quote. So the sovereign power of property owners extends well beyond their possessions to the social field around them, exerting a form of coercion over others that is equivalent to state forms of coercion. Recognizing property as a sovereign power that exerts social control supports the bundle of rights formulation in two ways. First, it poses the rights of others as a prime concern in the question of property. And second, it recognizes the action of the state as equally legitimate as the power of ownership to address and protect these rights. Now, let me pause for a second uh, to recognize something that interests me, and I, I'm not sure how much it would go for you, is that perhaps paradoxically, given the Cold War context of all this, these legal realists in the US, writing, say, from the 1920s to the 1950s, their arguments share key assumptions with the work of a great Soviet legal theorist, Eugenie Pashukanis. Uh, most significantly, they share the breach that they create in the standard division between civil law and public law, that is, between property and sovereignty. So Pashukanis, uh, who's maybe best known for a book called Marxism and Law, anyway, uh, early, early Soviet era uh, legal theorist, Pashukanis derives his theory from an attentive reading of Marx, and the legal realists frequently reject any connection to Marxism, partly for Cold War fears. But perhaps their subterranean connection is not so paradoxical when we remember that the orthodoxy of the Soviet state, from which the legal realists distanced themselves, was also hostile to Pashukanis, who was executed by St on Stalin's order in 1937. More important than common enemies, though, are shared arguments. Pashukanis, too, writing in the same years as these US theorists, similarly poses the connection between property and sovereignty, but he approaches it, so to speak, from the other side. Whereas these legal realists explain how property has the qualities of sovereignty, Pashukanish maintains that sovereignty is based on and expresses private property. Modern public and constitutional law, according to Pashukanish, derives from capitalist property in the commodity form. This is the main argument of that book that I mentioned, uh, Marxism, and, Marxism and Law, Pashukanish's book, is that the Constitution, that the Constitution and law itself, uh, bourgeois law, is an expression of the commodity form and is an expression of private property. That's the, his, the way he comes to it. And so sovereignty is a projection of private property just as private property is a condition of sovereignty. So whereas the recognition of the overlap and mixture of private and public affords the legal realists a means to recognize the rights of others and legitimate state action, <clears throat> 
The link leads Pashukanis, in contrast, to maintain that the abolition of private property requires to the abolition of the state, a position that certainly drew him no favor with Stalin and his inner circle. Uh, so, okay, leave aside the Pashukanis thing. Let me come back to the US tradition and move up now to the 1970s and 80s, the, and um, particularly here the, uh, the so-called uh, critical legal studies movement, of which the Harvard professor I mentioned in the anecdote was a central figure, uh, Duncan Kennedy. And they adopt more or less the, they revive the work of these uh, legal realists and extend their plural social notion of property. The continuation of this today sometimes goes under the rubric of progressive property. Like, let me, there was a sort of uh, two, three years ago, a manifesto of progressive property law, and this is something they write. They write, property implicates plural and incommensurable values, and that plurality forces us to reject all purely individualist conceptions of private, a property. And so what this means, it seems to me, is that property law can and should, uh, and they say continuing, uh, property law can and should establish the framework for a kind of social life appropriate to a free and democratic society. Yeah, so private property is never really private. This is what I, I guess I'm taking from, from those early 20th century legal realists to this contemporary movement that goes under that name of, of progressive property. Private property is never really private, and property law must take into account not only the entire set of social relations, but also seek to influence them, those social relations, toward freedom and democracy. There you go, that this should happen within pro uh, property, that one could struggle within property. So let me give you a, a couple of pragmatic examples. Here's one that this Duncan Kennedy, the guy I keep mentioning, because he sort of pushed me on this road. Maybe that's why I keep mentioning him. Um, the one that he advocates and the kind of things he wanted his students to do. He's advocated and uh, used legal, you know, pragmatic approach to try to influence what he calls limited equity co-ops um, as an alternate form of property that provides affordable housing to the poor. And this, in some ways, I, I want to see it as putting this bundle of rights conception into practice. So these co-ops combine nonprofit ownership with limited decision-making part participation by residents and attention to the interests of the larger community. So in order to, this is how the idea goes, something like this. In order to tame the pressures of the real estate market, he imagines a system whereby residents who sell their property will receive only what they paid for it plus some adjustment for inflation, and perhaps a fraction of the increase in, incre increase in equity. And so his idea here is that by limiting property rights and including in them, so, so wh whereas um, the kinds of gentrification that drive out low-income residents of cities, I don't even put it that way, um, is created by the sole ownership of property, that creating property forms in which there are many participants in it and that the rights are not exclusive of the owner, I think this is where he's going with this, um, that we would be able to both prevent the kind of um, gentrification that happens and allow for uh, affordable housing for others. Yeah, do you see, I hope you can see, I can't really ask a question in this sort of uh, context, but maybe I could ask that later. Uh, what I want you, what I want that to be an example of, like it might sound not that thrilling. It maybe doesn't sound that thrilling, like this uh, limited equity co-op. And so the, the primary things, the characteristics of it, like I said, is that, is that even if you own the apartment that you buy uh, in the co-op, even if you own it, you really don't have all the rights associated with ownership that we normally associate with ownership. So decision making is, is, is collective, that's true in many co-ops, but also the um, price, the value of the property doesn't accrue to you as owner. You know, so that you can't speculate on property that way is part of his idea. 
because you wouldn't get back any more than what you put into it. As a way of, this is a strategy for, yeah, like I said, of limiting, limiting the um, thing. So this, uh, I guess I should point out, before coming back to it briefly, that this US pragmatic approach to property doesn't generally function in Europe. Um, probably because in European property law, there remains primarily a substantialist conception of property. And the kinds of projects that are somewhat analogous to these figures um, take place primarily in debates between private property and the state. So I, I know these things better in Italy that probably than other places. Uh, someone who's been well known in Italy in the last years, a, a legal theorist named Stefano Rurota, Rurota. Um, and, and when he makes arguments uh, against privatization, like against privatization of the water supply, but also against the pri privatization like of a theater in Rome, this Teatro Valle, uh, an 18th century theater that was uh, scheduled to be privatized, you know, a public theater scheduled to be privatized, a beautiful old theater, and instead of allowing it to be privatized, the workers of the theater occupied it and have occupied it for months, and Rurota was among, among others that tried to argue in legal terms using the constitutional um, tools at their disposal that, that the theater shouldn't be privatized. But when he makes such arguments, he can't, within the Italian legal tradition, argue about a pluralization of the rights of property. He only can argue instead about that we need to make public again public goods. So it remains, so this substantialist notion of Private property in the European legal tradition, the continental tradition at least, I don't know anything about the Great Britain, um, is balanced in some sense by uh, an appeal to the public. But there isn't the, the same notion and doesn't, doesn't have the same uh, uses. And so in some ways, private property and public property have to be seen as external Whereas in this pragmatist and pragmatic US tradition, within private property are thought to be this whole bundle of rights, some of which are others in the community, some of those which belong to the state, et cetera, that all these different things that belong in these bundles. Yeah, so I don't, maybe I didn't describe, now that I'm saying that, I, I wonder if I didn't describe well enough before what this bundle of rights, what they mean by this. You know, like, so in some ways it's pluralizing, like I said, this is what I, I said so far, is that rather than the owner being the sole and sole possession of rights of property, it's saying that every form of every private property, instance of private property, there are a plurality of agents who have rights about it. So like you own that house. Um, if something is gonna be done to it, decision-making doesn't only, you do not have the sole right of decision-making. It also, other people who live in the neighborhood have their part of that bundle too. And something about uh, city regulations might be part of that bundle too. And any number of other actors might be too. And so what, so you, that's what they mean by this bundle. Like even if you aren't owner, you have rights over someone else's private property. That's the, what the pluralization they're trying to do. And so now just to repeat it again, the kind of strategies that they're advocating you know, come back to now, now a progressive professors of law at Harvard, and what they want their students to go out and do is to use the legal resources that emphasize the different plural agents that have rights over each form of property, and you then create legal battles that will, that will insist on the rights of others against the rights of the single property owner. Use this bundle as a way of, of operating pragmatically. Excuse me. So, in some ways the conceptual and practical bases of these legal strategies are also altered by the contemporary transformations of property. Like legal thought and practice have long dealt with various forms of property including services, intellectual and cultural products, even life forms, in addition to physical goods. The novelty of today's situation is not primarily that new forms of property have been introduced, but instead that the center of gravity of the property world 
has shifted from the material forms of property, which served as the classic reference for notions of possession and exclusion, towards the immaterial forms, which are in some respects immediately and inevitably social. A wide variety of legal scholars try to find mechanisms within the legal tradition to allow to flourish the forms of freedom and cooperation opened by network culture. I guess this is, maybe this is a placeholder in a way for an argument where, whereas the, this entire legal tradition or the various legal traditions are primarily based on material forms of property and they then try to treat immaterial forms of property in analogy to it, treating intellectual property, for instance, in analogy to material forms of property, I would argue that there's a tendency today, we're in a period in which these immaterial forms of pro property are becoming predominant over the material ones. And that should cause us to rethink the um, nature of property and the notion of rights associated with it. And in fact, uh, is more, these immaterial forms are in some senses more immediately social than the material forms. Okay. So property should be understood today not only as a bundle of rights, but even more precisely, this is the legal, critical legal studies uh, definition, as a set of social relations. That's what property is. So neither of these contemporary processes then, the transformation of sovereignty and property, invalidate the legal strategies that conceive property as a bundle of rights, a plural and social phenomenon. Instead, the new conditions, it seems to me, push such arguments further to de-emphasize the reliance on the public or the private and to recognize the intensely social nature of the phenomena to which property law tries to respond. Perhaps progressive legal theorists are asking property law to accomplish more than it can. At this point, the limitations of property as a legal construct begin to appear and we can glimpse a path in legal reasoning and practice that move toward the common. So the common, I, this is where I would argue at this point, and the common is really only one step further than this bundle of rights argument, and in some ways a step in which quantity passes over into quality. I guess I, what I mean by that is if you continue to expand the bundle of rights that define private property, at a certain point that increase in quantity, a bundle of rights, makes it really into something different. You know, like to come back to my original formulation about private property and its substantialist uh, classical definition as a form of monopoly. Uh, in some sense, what the, these US pragmatist theorists are doing is moving from a monarchical to an aristocratic conception. I'm thinking of this in geometrical terms, from the rule of one to the rule of the few that this bundle of rights is a limited um, group that has rights over it. And that what the common would simply be is a geometrical progression uh, that moves not just from monarchy to aristocracy, but from aristocracy to democracy. Uh, in other words, from the rule of the one to the rule of the few, and from the rule of the few to the rule of all. In other words, as, as you increase this notion of the plurality of those who have a right over property, it ceases to become private and becomes, I think, identical to what I was trying to describe the common as before. Uh, let me, you know, that, that, leaves, uh, that leaves out this question about the left, but let me first give a very brief idea of an analogous path that I would see taking through legal thought in continental Europe um, that I think goes in the same direction. Like I said before, the, the European legal tradition maintains a substantialist concept of property, meaning uh, without the pluralities of the US pragmatic approach. Um, these, this legal tradition didn't call itself pragmatist, but it seems to me shares a lot with the philosophical tradition in the US of pragmatism. So the, the European legal tradition doesn't share that but I think it can arrive at a similar conclusion passing through concepts of property uh, grounded in labor. The, 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 this is where the European constitutions differ greatly from the US constitution. Um, the, in, 
In continental Europe, there's a great constitutional reliance or constitutional relevance of labor, much more significant um, that, than, in, than in the US and maybe elsewhere. Like for instance, in Italy, the post-war constitution, the first sentence of the Italian constitution of 1848, 1948, I'm sorry, of 1948 says, Italy is a republic founded on labor. And that notion of labor and organized labor having a constitutional role um, is something that, um, that also that legal theorists, progressive legal theorists, in continental Europe, Europe work through. So just let me give you the very out, the outline of this, of this argument, the kind of points it would make. It, it would start from um, a, a legitimation of private property that would start from Locke. And I think that the philosophical tradition starts here. So Locke in the second treatise in the section on property um, defines property as arising out of the common when the common or nature is mixed with someone's labor. And the, the precondition for this to be true, like so his, his idea is if you mix nature with your labor, then the result is, is your property. The, the precondition for this that, that Locke says is that your labor is your property. And so it's, it, this only refers to non-slaves, I guess you'd say, but also refers to a conception of the human as, having, as owning one's own labor power. So that uh, basic and initial property that you own, your labor power, it's a kind of, it has a kind of um, contamination quality. Like anything you, that comes in contact with it, it makes into yours too. I think that is a kind of contamination. Yeah, so the idea with the soil, you know, that, that it, when the earth, when you work on something, then that, the result becomes yours. So like you build that house, you cut down that tree, you do X. That what you mix your labor with, that's his way of saying it, becomes your property. So the right of property, this is, this is what begins with Locke, and continues strongly in, I would say, in, in a variety of ways, is the notion that property, that the justification, legitimation of private property is based on labor. You have the right to something that you made. I would say that this, even with a variety of transformations in um, both in legal conceptions and, and certainly in economic transformations, I think that, that throughout the world, not just in Europe, that um, that basic common sense persists about labor being the foundation of property. Like for instance, to just give you a, I don't know, rudimentary example that the way US property law is written is um, that in order to claim um, a patent on something, is that this is patent law, sorry. Uh, the way in, claim, in order to claim a patent on something, you have to demonstrate that you made it. Like that seems maybe just obvious to you, doesn't it? So that, uh, so when things are thrown out, for instance, you know, someone tries to patent, I don't know, apple tree. Like you can't patent apple tree. Like you didn't make it. It's not a product of your labor. But if you made a certain strain of apple tree, or even if you made a certain strain of mice, then you can patent it because it was it was what it was a product of your labor. Um, okay, Marx of course objects to this. Well, he objects about it in an ironic way. He says that uh, capitalist ideology, of course, believes that uh, private property is founded in labor. But capital already has done away with it. Like whenever, so, whenever he brings up in his arguments, oh, what they say communists are going to do is destroy, capitalist, uh, destroy private property, capital already did that. Because the, especially in industrial production, this is what he's mostly referring to, but in capitalist production in general, the one who produces something isn't the owner of it. Uh, it's in fact the non-worker who gains property rights. So that the capital, he argues, kind of ironically, it's a Marx kind of joke, capital already destroys capitalist private property by, by depriving the worker of the product of, of, of his or her labor. Um, it seems to me it, it, it preserves anyway. What, what I would want to then in this argument look at is the ways in which labor and production have transformed in recent decades to become increasingly socialized and cooperative. Um, 
In other words, that especially when we think about the production of immaterial goods, like I was talking about before, the production of ideas and images and code, production of affects in many ways too, these are um, forms of production that are always necessarily socialized. Um, so that in some ways you could say it like this, that, pri that private property, when it was attached to the one who produced it, um, loses its individual character. Like if you are still going to ground uh, the right to property on the, on the one who produced it, it's never really one who produced it. It would have to already be socialized because of the social nature, increasingly social nature of production itself. Yeah, I think that that's where, I mean, so it, that's where I would take that argument that the increasing socialization of labor, continuing to base the right of property on the, on the, on the, um, on the enactment of labor, with the increasing socialization of labor, that property too would have to be socialized. And at that point too, you would have to say that um, there's, the similar kind of passage of quantity into quality I was talking about before with these bundle of rights would have to pertain to labor right too. So like for instance, when you say the production of knowledge, if you'd say, well, okay, not one person didn't come up with this idea, you might at first try to say that, well, this team of scientists came up with this idea. But then when you look back further, it wasn't even just a, a limited number, but an entire open set of social relations that produce that knowledge. And so if you're gonna still link the right of property, like Locke does, to the producer, it would have to be, come something like what we're calling the common already. So this is what I was trying to do with both of these, um, with both of these paths. Um, to say, to try to understand the common as emerging from yeah, the common is a third thing that's neither public nor private that emerges from the carrying to an extreme or, or, or even passing one more step in each of these legal discourses. So the one, I, yeah, the one I talked about more here, I'll just say this part again, that as the bundle of rights are extended to society as a whole, quantity passes over into quality, property loses its sovereign character and is transformed into the common. Yeah, so, so when I say the common, this is another thing that just might give you pause or something. When I say the common, it doesn't mean that you have to let anyone use your toothbrush or that you have to, that you can't, what it means, so it doesn't mean just opening, I, I, that's an example that gives a lot of people the willies. Um, but it means rather that there has to be a collective decision making about how goods and things will be used. So. Um, so what it re means, yeah, is that the right to decide, that, the right, uh, that we will have the right to decide together, equally and democratically, about access, use, and management, and distribution of social wealth. That's what the common would look like, and in some ways as an extension of this bundle of rights. The rights of the common also emerges in this other argument, which I only gave really uh, in skeletal form, from the development of the subjective rights of laboring subjects, when labor is socialized and the whole society becomes a terrain of valorization, when the intelligence, corporeal activity, culture, and creative powers of all are put to work and together produce and reproduce society, then the control of and decisions over the means of production and reproduction um, must be equally socialized by the same notion of the establishment of property based on labor. There you go. That the common becomes the key to productivity and private property becomes an obstacle that interferes productive capacities. So those are the two things. So let me come, those are the two, okay. Those are the two trajectories of how I see the possibility of the common, of a legal understanding of the common, emerging through established practices of uh, property law. That's really, that's really what, I, what I wanted that. So that brings me back to these two versions of the left. Um, and in one sense, I guess, I think of them as a false problem, of these two versions of the left. 
This is partly what I, if you, you might have plenty of other things to say, but if nothing else, um, you might think about this last problem and how, how it goes with this. Um, it seems to me that, ref, that, that essentially the question of reform versus revolution, the antagonism between them, also that between theory and pragmatic or practical approaches, that both of these debates have at times had political relevance, and to me it seems that they don't. Um, that reform versus revolution is, is not a moment when that distinction carries much value. And I guess what I, the, the, the reason of my trying to take this journey through reformist versions of, of property law is to demonstrate how, at least in this case, about property in the common, legal conceptions of property in the common, how the two are really not antagonistic to another, but they can also feed each other. You know, part of the reason I want some help about this, this is Tony, Tony my co-author, often criticizes me for not liking to fight enough. Like that my, my I, he thinks I'm too conciliatory. Like that I'm trying to make, not, not too conciliatory, that I'm too, that I want to recognize continuities rather than uh, emphasizing lines of conflict. This is the one, one instance though where it seems to me there isn't one. Yes, between um, uh, reform and revolution, but then come back to the specific thing. Like, so for the specific thing about these um, law students, the fears of their professors that they would not go out and practice law in a progressive way and the students desire to make radical arguments and radical changes in society. So it seems this is another instance where at least it's seeming to me that the two are not exclusive but complementary. Like that this, um, I, I guess I don't see why such uh, practicing graduated lawyers can't use the resources of the law to argue for these limited equity co-ops and still make arguments against property uh, for the common. Or here, one last example about this. I, w I, was, um, I was attracted by stories that I was told by um, some of the protesters at Gezi Park in the Istanbul 2013 protests I was mentioning earlier who said, who worked in offices in downtown Istanbul, and they said that they would, um, they would go out at night and change into black outfits with um, bandanas across their face and battle the cops, and then in the morning they would go and sort of like Superman, uh, get to put on their white shirts and work in their offices during the day. And uh, they were kind of um, thrilled by the connection between these two lives, day, night, and uh, night light. And, um, and I guess that's what uh, the way I'm conceiving the potential compatibility of these two versions of the left that were posed, at least in this anecdote that I've continually returned to, as incompatible. Okay, so there you have it. That's, uh, that's it.